Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have the distinct uh, pleasure of introducing our Consul General, Honorable P. Harish, today. Our Consul General has been here only for the last four months. He recently took over. He's a man of wide foreign service experience. He has been in the Indian Foreign Service for the last 20 years. And his last assignment was in the office of our Vice President of India in New Delhi. As I said, he came to Houston, which is his office. But he has been coming to Dallas in the last four months for over a I believe six or seven times. And I hope this is a prelude to his moving here. <laughs> For long we have been requesting that we needed a consulate office in Dallas. But we are happy to welcome him in our midst and I invite him to come to the stage and introduce Ambassador Honorable Narakumar. Thank you, Mr. Pandya. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to be here participating in this function of the very dynamic and important chamber, uh, which has contributed significantly in the last 10 years to ensuring Texas remains key to our bilateral trade and commercial relationship, contributing 11% of our trade. And uh, a lot of this goes to the current team and the previous uh, uh, chairs and members of the board of the chamber. It's my distinct honor to introduce today's uh, chief guest, Ambassador Nirupama Rao. Uh, she joined the Foreign Service almost four decades ago, and she has been a trailblazer of sorts in more ways than one. Uh, she has been the first uh, lady spokesperson of the Indian Foreign Ministry and uh, she has been the first lady high commissioner to Sri Lanka. She has held distinguished ambassadorial positions uh, to China. Uh, she has been the foreign secretary of India. She has had wide experience in dealing with issues of uh, uh, China, East Asia and she has served here uh, twice prior to her taking up uh, current position as ambassador uh, September last year. She's widely recognized for her leadership role uh, on various aspects, including uh, those relating to women, to education, and uh, she has uh, been widely admired in uh, various uh, cross-sections of society in India for her leadership role and her uh, uh, ease of use of modern media in getting communication across. She has a wide uh, following uh, on uh, uh, Twitter and on Facebook. Uh, Ambassador Rao, it's uh, my distinct pleasure to welcome you on stage to give your chief guest address. Thank you. to turn the light off. Possible to turn that off. Thank you. A very good evening to all of you distinguished people gathered here today. Elected officials, members of the Greater Dallas Indo-American Chamber of Commerce and friends, I recognize many friends in the audience today. Our Consul General, uh, Mr. Harish, is well known to you. I thank him for his words of introduction also. And I thank Dr. Uh, Mr. Ashok Mago for making my visit to Dallas possible. 
I see before me today so many distinguished citizens of Dallas and, of course, Texans from all over your great state. Coming here to Dallas was especially pleasant for me because you, you have such wonderful weather. <laughs> and, and leaving Washington yesterday, uh, when I left DC yesterday morning, it was the day before yesterday evening, it was pretty, pretty cold, I must say, extremely cold. And this is wonderful to have a taste of this very salubrious climate of yours. Talking of salubrious climate, I think I would apply the same epithet to the relationship between India and the United States today. There has been such tangible improvement in that relationship in the last decade or so. The days of the past are very, very much behind us. And today we share a strategic partnership between the two countries that is important to both our democracies for so many reasons, not only because of the values we share and our convergent interests in so many areas, but because it unites the people of both countries. And in this process of coming together, the role that the Indian American community in this country has played. The community has played such an important role in bringing our two nations closer together. I just have to look back at the last few years, for instance, when we were negotiating the civil nuclear deal between our two governments. It was the community that came forward with great commitment and great focus and great enthusiasm to see that this deal was realized. And we recognize that role, we celebrate that role, and we applaud that role. The relationship, as I mentioned to you, is built upon so many common interests and extends into areas that affect the lives of both people, people of both countries, in such a good and positive manner. I am talking not only of the strategic dialogue between leaders of the two countries. In fact, our leaders, both Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh of India and President Barack Obama of the United States, refer to this relationship as a, the most important partnership that could happen between two countries. President Obama refers to it as a defining, indispensable partnership. And Prime Minister Manmohan Singh has spoken very eloquently about the principles and the pragmatism that bind our two countries together. But beyond that, beyond even the political will that brings our two countries together, there, is, there are the economic and business ties that bind our two nations. There is cooperation in so many fields of developmental endeavor, whether it's in education, which has become one of the pillars of our partnership today, whether it's in health, whether it's in agriculture, just today, at over lunch, I met the daughter of Dr. Norman Bonock. And some of you who may not have heard about the role that Dr. Bob Bonock played in bringing our two nations closer together, let me just say that when we remember the green revolution that happened in India in the 60s of the last century, in the, in the 60s of the 20th century, it was Dr. Borlaug who played such a seminal role in helping to change the entire landscape of agricultural production in India. And I met his daughter today, and I was very privileged to meet her. Dr. Borlaug passed away a few years ago. But next year, we will be celebrating 50 years of that green revolution in India and the visit of Dr. Borlaug to India. So just to recount to you how closely we have worked over the years in transforming the lives of people in both our countries. So when I speak of our cooperation in agriculture and health, energy is another area that we are giving a great deal of attention to in our strategic partnership. In all this, I think Dallas and the state of Texas can play and has played a very, very important role. Consul General Harish referred to the 
quantum of trade that we have between your state of Texas and India, and in which the city of Dallas, again, has played such an important role. Trade between India and the United States touched around 100 billion US dollars last year in goods and services. But the best is yet to be. We have not even, I think, been able to tap a fraction of the potential that exists for trade and business ties between our two countries. And investment, the investment ties are also of a great deal of importance because investment is what drives economic growth, we know everywhere. Today, the world economic scene does not look that good. We've had a recession over the last few years. I know here in this country, there have been uh, issues and challenges that you have faced as far and continue to face as far as the economy is concerned. There are issues of employment, of jobs, of, uh, of industries closing down. All these obviously will need to be corrected if we are to see growth moving forward once again. And America's growth is very important for the rest of the world also. Today, nobody lives in an island. No country can live in isolation. We're all interconnected in so many ways. The information revolution has taught us that, of course. But also, in myriad, myriad ways, we are connected. And we cannot afford to be isolated from each other. So the questions of openness, of transparency, of communication are also vital for countries such as ours. And in India, over the last few years, we have seen a marked change, a transformation within the country because economic growth has accelerated. It has slowed down because of the global economic recession and because there have been certain constraints, supply side constraints and inflation within the country. But overall, the growth rate of the Indian economy has been very, very good. And when you compare it with what is happening in other parts of the world, you know, India's case in terms of fast economic growth continues to stand out. But that is not enough for us. We have to ensure that our growth rate goes forward, peaks again, because it's only then that we will be able to lift people out of poverty in a substantive way. Let me say that in the last four to five years, millions of people, millions of people in India have been lifted out of poverty. And when I say millions, I'm not talking of one or two or three million. I'm talking of, you know, 40, 50, 60 million people being lifted out of poverty. We have a country of 1.2 billion people. We have a large middle class approaching about 350 million people, but there are a number of our countrymen and women who still live in poverty. And the focus of the governmental endeavor is to ensure inclusive growth that would, would lift our fellow citizens, those of whom have been underserved in the past, enable them to have a better future, a brighter tomorrow. And that is where investment comes in. We need investment, particularly investment in infrastructure. Infrastructure is key to India's development. The other day at the Foreign Policy Institute in Washington, I was asked by Congressman Randy Forbes, who was chairing that session, as to what India's key priorities were, if I were to speak of just two or even three priorities. And I said to him, the first priority is infrastructure, infrastructure development. The second is energy, because India needs energy. India has a boundless, almost unquenchable thirst for energy. And here in Texas, you know what energy is all about. You understand energy. You, you know the, the, you feel it, and you understand why it's so important for economic well-being and growth. And in India, we are dependent on energy imports, by and large. About 70 to 75 percent of our energy requirements come from abroad. And therefore, in order to ensure economic growth and progress, and again, being able to uplift the lives of people in India, we need access to energy, to clean energy, to cheap energy. 
And I know here in your country, in the United States, you've seen a transformation of the energy scene with the discovery of shale gas in the last few years. It's, it's really changed the, the position of the United States when it comes to energy worldwide. I mean, the whole geopolitics, the geoeconomics of energy is going to change as a result of this. And we would like to have access, definitely, to, to this new energy that these resources that you have been able to develop here in this country after you've taken care of your own needs, of course. But certainly, this is one aspect on which we would like a continuing dialogue and a fruitful dialogue with the United States so that our own supplies can be augmented in India. The third priority is education. And here again, you know, we have such distinguished uh, representatives, spokespersons, proponents of education here in our audience today. Education is important naturally for India because it concerns the youth 